Welcome to the CCA event, uh, the presentation by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace on Divisive Politics and Democratic Changes in Latin America, one of recently released report, which is gaining a lot of attention. Um, before we delve into the presentation today, let me do as I always do, which cover a couple of preliminary items. One, um, if you have a question for today's panelists, please use the the um, the question, the Q&A box, and we'll be pleased to entertain as many of those as we can. Um, we will not be taking audio questions. Um, this event also will be posted on our website, as you know, ccacanada.com afterwards, and we will try and get it up tonight, although it's going to end a little late in the afternoon, so I imagine it will be up by tomorrow at the latest. You're welcome to view that and to send it to those, um, to whomever you care, just to, to view it as well. Upcoming events um, on March 24th and then April 5th will be the third and the fourth installment of our series co-hosted with Sandra Borda, a political scientist from the University of Andes called Looking for the Center or Buscando el Centro. We do it in Spanish with simultaneous interpretation into English. And it is precisely as the title says, looking for a center in Colombian politics with the lead up to the presidential elections next year. On April 24th, we'll have Juan Fernando Cristo who will be with us and on, we've just confirmed on April 5th, we will have Juanita Gobertas with us as well. Those, those, as I say, the third and the fourth, there will be others. The first one was with Humberto de la Calle and last week with Juan Manuel Galan. Uh, and just one other upcoming event uh, on April 27th, we've just confirmed our annual awards gala that will be virtual this year, as you might imagine. Uh, and there will be a lot more information coming about that very, very quickly. And um, so it'll be, you'll be receiving emails. And again, there'll be more information at ccacanada.com. Okay, with that, let's, let's get straight away to the presentation today. As I mentioned, it is a presentation of an important report uh, put out by the Carnegie Endowment, uh, co-edited by Tom Carruthers. Uh, Tom, for those listening, really needs no introduction, um, but I'll, so I'll give a brief one anyway. He is now the acting president of the Carnegie Endowment. He is a senior VP for studies at the Carnegie Endowment, uh, and he is, the, as I mentioned, the co-editor of this report we'll be discussing today. Uh, there have been six contributors to this report. Two of them are with us today. Oliver Stunkel from the Gertulio Vargas Institute in Brazil and Angelica Redberg, from Los Andes University in Bogota. Uh, with that, um, I don't think I have any more preliminaries. And Tom, please take it away. Thank you, Ken, and thanks to CCA for hosting this event. We're delighted to be here and present some of our ideas. I'm gonna give a, just a brief overview, and then I'm gonna to turn to Angelica for a perspective on Colombia and Oliver for a perspective on Brazil. We're living in an age in which democratic politics in many parts of the world are increasingly defined by a, a very harsh level of divisiveness. We see it manifested in just sharp divisions between contending political elites, polarization filtering down into the society and really entrenching itself in societies. We see it in surging protests. This has been the last five years that had a greater surge of anti-government protests or just protests generally than probably any five years in modern history. And we also see outsider candidates or politicians pushing against systems, challenging the rules, challenging the existing political elite. So the temperature of politics just seems to be good. Democratic politics seems to be going up in many, many places. Now, <clears throat> this is true in Latin America as much as other regions, and perhaps more. Look at 2019, before the pandemic hit. 2019 was a year marked by remarkable events of divisive politics in Latin America. In Chile, in late 2019, you had the explosion of large-scale protests that caught Chilean society and politics by surprise. Colombia also had uh, protests that surged in the country. Uh, again, somewhat unexpectedly, Ecuador had a significant number of protests and convulsions in the country. Brazil was descending into the sort of fractious politics that market today that Oliver's going to talk about. Mexico was having what's called the 
slipper revolution and the anger about violence against women. Bolivia was having really paroxysms of political conflict over the potential extension of Evo Morales' presidency. So throughout Latin America, and one could mention other countries, you had really marked events um, signaling the sort of intensification of divisive politics in these countries. They were around economic issues, like in Chile, where you had anger over economic marginalization. They were around social issues, like in Mexico, about violence against women. They were about political issues, like Morales' presidency. So there were a whole different sort of set of roots of these kinds of divisive politics, but a, sort of a common pattern in many places. Now, then the pandemic came. On top of all of this divisiveness, you had an event that you know, has started to redefine or actually intensify, I think, many of the characteristics of political and economic life in Latin America. Now, some people hoped when the pandemic hit that a pandemic might, by its nature, an outside threat to a society, might bring countries more together. Um, common threat, maybe it would cause political elites to put aside their differences, work together to fight it. Societies very divided maybe can come together to fight this pandemic. But unfortunately, in many places, uh, the pandemic has not been a unifying event. Uh, in political life in a number of countries, it's been one more thing to fight about, one more thing to argue about the government's response, one more set of policies that turn out to be just as divisive as, as policies on other issues. Moreover, the pandemic has inflamed inequalities in many societies, highlighting the fact that, you know, there's just gross socioeconomic and sociopolitical inequalities in many of these countries that the pandemic has cast into sharper relief. And on top of that, you have the economic crisis that the pandemic brings with it, which inevitably turns up the temperature in a society of sociopolitical conflict when people are feeling pushed to the limit economically, pessimistic about their future and suffering. So the pandemic has been a tough event to occur in a region that was already racked by a level of divisiveness that was really raising questions. Now, divisive politics, you could say, well, democracy is divisive. That's the whole point of democracy. Contending sides should fight. But a certain level of divisiveness becomes dangerous. When it reaches an extreme, a fever can become very harmful. It can, for example, cause just basic governmental dysfunction system grinding to a halt and the gears of politics just grinding against each other. It can cause instability, uh, like we've seen in Bolivia, uh, Peru to some extent, instability that just causes a lack of focus on policies and on sort of practical politics. And it can cause illiberalism as one side tries to gain an advantage over the other and squeeze the life out of the other side and begins to restrict freedoms and so forth. So the consequences of and severely divisive politics are very serious. Um, and so in this report, we tried to look at a number of different countries to identify the sources of the division, the nature of the division, how the pandemic affected the trajectory, what are the current sort of risks, and also some look at, well, what can be done in this context to try to sort of take some steps away from severe levels of divisiveness. And so <clears throat> using that framework, we're going to turn to a couple of cases which are quite contrasting. The case of Brazil is a case of just very intense divisiveness right now, as Oliver will talk about. Uh, on top of, you know, six or seven years now in Brazil of really difficult political life, basically starting in 2013 with the breakdown of the basic consensus on the political lead in the country. But then the case of Colombia, which is actually quite different different source of division in the society. And as Angelica will say, actually maybe some, some signs of optimism about uh, divisions to some extent, maybe starting to, to reduce a little bit. And the pandemic context has not been as inflammatory as it has in other countries. So we're purposely trying to give you here a snapshot on two different patterns here. But I wanted to give you, paint you a picture that as always, Latin America is just one part of the global landscape. And it's important to see what can be sometimes considered particular features of Latin American life because of the high levels of inequality and the conflict that produces seems to be part of a larger pattern in the world of divisiveness increasing. So we want to understand the region both in its own terms, every country in its own terms, but as part of a regional pattern and in turn as part of a global pattern. So that's just to set the stage a bit, Ken. Let me turn it over to Angelica now for uh, some thoughts on Colombia. Angelica, please, over to you. 
Well, thank you so much, Tom, and thank you also, Ken and, and Oliver, for, for this conversation that we will have today and for the invitation. It's lovely to be with you today um, uh, to engage in a discussion which is relevant in light of three things that are happening as we speak. First of all, uh, uh, today there was a first public meeting between uh, Rodrigo Londoño, who is still FARC's, the, the demobilized guerrillas main commander, with Salvatore Mancuso, who was the leader of the paramilitary groups, the counterinsurgent rightist groups that fought not only guerrilla members, but civil society overall. And they met for the first time, of course, uh, online, uh, facilitated by the Truth Commission. On the other hand, uh, well, in, in, and in that meeting, they ex ex expressed their, their shared interest in uh, addressing human rights violations and overcoming some of the legacies of the long armed conflict that the, that, that the country has undergone. At the same time, in Barranquilla, on the Caribbean coast, uh, the General Assembly of the Inter-American Development Bank uh, is going on, and there the talk has nothing to do with what these two gentlemen discussed. There it is all about economic reactivation, about the development of the infrastructure needed to bolster ongoing Colombian development, uh, and there, and, and also about overcoming some of the effects of this awful pandemic that, that still keeps us uh, speaking from our home offices. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, uh, an event that also happened today is an expression on behalf of former President Alvaro Uribe, who is on the one hand hugely popular, but on the other hand has also been criticized for his role in some of the uh, 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 some of the some of the violations of human rights on behalf of the Colombian state and for a strong hand approach, uh, and he came out saying, you know, that the uh, that the intention expressed by several Congress people to prolong the presidential term for an additional two years was not correct, was not something desired. And this is interesting because these Congress people, uh, some of them belong to his own party. So to have this very strong statement on the one hand in favor of respecting the agreed upon terms, to have this large Latin American event that's all about development going on in Barranquilla and have this meeting between these former warlords, if you want to call them in any way, I think illustrates really well some of the tensions that Colombia is undergoing, which are, as Tom already mentioned, both a source, of course, of concerns because there are lingering questions that we need to address, but also in a way uh, show some light, I guess, in terms of uh, where future where future developments can go, uh, to where where, we, where where future paths perhaps can go uh, can go. Uh, so what I would like to do is just briefly illustrate some of these tensions and to show in a way how these three processes uh, um, develop themselves on parallel tracks. This is all happening at the same time. An allegiance to democratic institutions, uh, a commitment to overcoming. Uh, some of the some of the divisions of the past and the promotion of economic development and also the intent the the, the interest in, in overcoming some of the legacies of armed conflict. None of this has been simple, of course. There is, of course, ongoing polarization in regards to any of these topics. But I think, it, 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 as I said, this illustrates really well some of the parallel processes processes that are happening in the country. So I'd briefly like to go from one point from, I mean, discuss briefly some of these issues. First of all, uh, as, as, as you know, uh, Colombia reached a peace agreement in 2016 between the national government and FARC, uh, which was until then the largest remaining guerrilla group in Latin America. Uh, it was agreed that the group would demobilize and turn into a political party. Uh, but it would have uh, guaranteed seats in the legislative, uh, um, in, the, in Congress. And then in addition to that, there would be a very ambitious transitional justice system building on, and I have to say, I have to stress this, building on previous transitional justice developments uh, and infrastructures in the country, uh, in addition to uh, rural reform and programs to address one uh, historic problem that Colombia has, which is illicit crops and the role of Colombian peasants and also, and, and also of criminal organization in the drug trade. Uh, what, what, what the agreement uh, said in, at, at a point, I mean, this is, this is almost five years ago, has only been partially implemented. Uh, there has been huge um, progress, and I would say the transitional justice system has really 
uh, gained traction because it has been able to produce some, uh, not sentences yet, but at least some uh, 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 cases against the major FARC commanders in issues such as kidnappings, uh, which, is a, which is a violation of human rights that affected thousands of Colombians, especially during the 90s and early 2000s. There have also been, there's also been a case developed in regards to the body count policy, the so-called false positive policy uh, that the armed forces have pursued uh, for, a, for, for, several, for several decades too, in order to produce uh, numbers, figures to illustrate their efficacy on the battleground, uh, which of course led to uh, civilians being falsely accused of being uh, guerrilla members and having died in combat, which they didn't. So there has been uh, progress on that too. In addition, there is uh, discussions, ongoing discussions about the recruitment of minors. Uh, there will be a case about sexual violence as well happened, that happened during conflict. So in, in a sense, transitional justice, the transitional justice system, although it has been severely criticized because uh, some people would prefer just ordinary justice to, to work better and, not, and transitional justice not to be needed, others just feel that some of these uh, um, agreements were too lenient with FARC, uh, has shown that it has the capacity to deliver on some of the expectations. And I think this is something that is worthwhile underscoring. Also, FARC has been able to uh, turn into a political party that, as I said, has a guaranteed presence in the Congress, um, which has been very hard for FARC to, um, uh, to, to fulfill. I mean, they, they, turning, turning a guerrilla into a party uh, presents all sorts of challenges. And here, of course, uh, uh, having, having been a very decentralized, albeit hierarchical organization developed for uh, battle purposes or for combat pur purposes is very different from learning about legislative technicalities, about institutions, about building coalitions and alliances with other parties. Uh, and this in the context, of course, in which uh, being on the left of the ideological spectrum uh, in Colombia has, has, has been considered suspicious for years. So FARC has had a very difficult time, not only uh, making its own transformation, but finding allies uh, in the process. However, as I said, I think that the crucial point is that they have made this transition from guerrilla to party, and they are now having a formal presence. They actually changed their name finally to Comunes, which, which, uh, which is a way of, of basically addressing uh, the, the very negative reputation that the, that the FARC uh, label has caused them due to the impacts that they've caused throughout, throughout conflict. On the other hand, of course, there are several aspects of the agreement that are still not being implemented, especially in relation to rural reform and especially and, and also in relation to illicit crops. As you may know, illicit crops have in fact grown uh, in terms of their extension on, on the national territory since, since the, the peace agreement, which at one point third critics the idea that, uh, that in fact, uh, 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 the agreement with FARC was sort, of a, was sort of an entry point for the Colombian state to retreat from cultural territories and from, from, from diminishing its efforts in combating criminal organizations. At this point, this is an issue that is, that is causing severe concern, especially, uh, and I guess in that relation, uh, we need to talk about borders as well. Because the drug trade, of course, is not something that affects Colombia alone, but this is something that uh, spills over to the borders, both to the east with Venezuela and to the south uh, with Brazil, Peru, and Ecuador. So, so this is a regional problem, again, uh, which is caused by Colombia. Uh, just to say that there is a, let's say, uh, 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 there are reasons for hope in the in, in the implementation of the peace agreement, I think. Uh, we could say we, we can say safely that the main institutions related to the agreement have gained traction and are no longer under constant uh, questioning on behalf of critics of the agreement as it as it looked like in, in the early days, uh, despite the fact that there have been FARC dissidents and despite the fact that there's ongoing violence, especially in areas where uh, illicit crops are grown um, uh, and, 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 and where, where, where social leaders are being killed. Despite that, uh, overall, um, the feeling in many regions of Colombia, especially in those hardest hit by conflict, is that the agreement is slow to be implemented, but that it has improved overall the lives of many people. And I think this is something that 
that, that leads me then to the second point, which is this idea about uh, this idea defended by many on the right who used to question the agreement as, as being too lenient with FARC, as I said earlier, um, and, and promoting a view to sort of leave the past behind, sort of, you know, move on, look to the future, look at the opportunity uh, that the future offers us, uh, stop discussing the legacies of the past in order to uh, develop to its full potential, develop the country to its full potential. Uh, and there is where this assembly that is going on right now in Barranquilla, I think, comes in very nicely because it's all about that. No one is speaking about FARC or, or, or the agreement or, or, or the Truth Commission or anything of that kind there. It's mostly about how can we uh, uh, bring development to these regions that have been historically abandoned by the state um, and that need to be developed over and beyond whatever illegal actor is operating there. And I think this image that Colombia is, 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 is selling to the world is, 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 as I said, partially correct, but also illustrates very strong political will to leave the past behind and to leave especially the polarization associated with, with the peace agreement behind and to promote uh, a discourse much more centered on this idea that we should try to find uh, a, a common ground, a, a historical pact, a center where we can all uh, find, uh, provide, I guess, solutions for some of the problems that Colombia has, still has. In addition then to that, uh, the pandemic, I think, also illustrates this, this, this move to the center, this, uh, this, this interest by, by even, even by elites on the, on the, on the, on the extremes of the ideological spectrum to find common ground because uh, as opposed to other cases in America, in Latin America and in the world, in Colombia, there was something that I call sort of a scientific convergence among national and local authorities uh, in terms of how to deal with both contagion and the vaccine. Vaccine rollout was incredibly slow, slow and we're still, we're still suffering about that. Uh, but overall, um, um, in contrast with other countries, there was, I think, a quite, quite, quite noticeable uh, agreement or consensus in terms of how this pandemic should be handled. Uh, on, on, on social networks, you will find all sorts of debates. But again, if you compare to this to what happened in other countries, I think the, the, the remarkable thing is how many, how much, how much agreement and how much efforts there were to actually collaborate. I think I'm running out of time. I would just, I would just like to stress then, then that my third point, which is related to this allegiance to democratic institutions. I think one aspect that needs to be stressed in this context. And, and, and that results from comparing the country with itself, really, uh, one generation ago, is that much of this debate uh, is happening in within the con within the compounds of democratically established uh, institutions. Uh, Colombian state is still weak, still imperfect in many ways, uh, but the fact that that that, that the that the, that the existing state institutions are um, uh, the sort of the the, the background against which most of, most of this debate takes place, and which, as I said to the, today, was defended even by someone who would benefit from a from an extension of the presidential period, I think speaks to this uh, uh, growing strength growing institutional strength uh, in, in which I would expect uh, the coming years would see uh, uh, an improvement, or I mean, maybe not improvement, but at least uh, um, an, an avoidance of this ongoing polarization to, to take too much control of, 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 the, of the ongoing political debate. And that's, I think I will just leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Angelica. Yeah, Colombia is just a fascinating case of can a country move beyond cataclysmic divisions? into a better future that overcomes that within the boundaries of democratic institutions, despite the cross-cutting divisions you talk about um, that are so complex in Colombia. Let's turn to the Brazilian case, not, not a simpler case, but an equally important and actually a fascinating one. Oliver? Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for the invitation, Ken. It's a pleasure to join this debate. I, uh, I wanted to make uh, four, uh, I'm just taking the time to make sure that We'll have time for the discussion. I wanted to, uh, to share four big ideas. Why is polarization in Brazil so destructive? How did Brazil get there? Um, how is Bolsonaro, the current president, benefiting from polarization? Uh, why is polarizing a way for him to govern and how we can understand his success? And fourth, 
what's next for Brazilian politics. I think that um, Brazil is perhaps uh, one of the best cases to distinguish between useful, quote unquote, helpful or constructive polarization, which was a reality in our politics from, I'd say, the late 1990s until 2013, which were, I would say, the golden years of Brazilian democracy because we had two very distinct uh, options which were constantly fighting, but they were fighting assume, uh, accepting the legitimacy of the other. And they were accepting defeat because they knew that the other party wasn't so obsessed with holding on to power that they wouldn't get another chance four years down the line to reach power again. So there was a degree of cordiality which made, you know, politics very fascinating. We had, you know, high level debates. And that, of course, changed, uh, I would say, since 2013. I will talk to that in a minute about that in a minute. But why is it so destructive? Is because Brazil in the developing world has one of the best public health systems in the world, one of the best immuniz immunization systems. It has a large number of internationally recognized health experts, and it had the knowledge to tackle this pandemic much, much better uh, than it is actually performing right now. Uh, we have nearly 3,000 deaths per day. The health system is in collapse. Uh, everybody's, uh, at, or whoever can, uh, is at home because uh, here in Sao Paulo, for example, uh, no hospitals are able to take on any additional patients. And in a way, this is because of polarization, because the way the government politicized even very basic issues is a reflection of how polarization, extreme polarization has become the norm in Brazilian politics. So using a mask or not is a political statement. Being in favor of social distancing measures is today in Brazil a political statement. Uh, you know, being willing to get the vaccine is a political statement. And that of course has led, that explains why Brazil is not only, or, or the government has been unable to protect its own population, but why Brazil today is seen as a serious risk uh, to uh, the entire world, because uh, it is a country of more than 200 million people and the spread of the virus is largely unchecked, which of course increases the likelihood of the emergence of uh, variants that could reduce the effectiveness of vaccines that which are being applied uh, in other parts of the world. So, uh, and I think that, um, you know, the reaction to this report, I, I told uh, Tom about this and, uh, you know, <clears throat> this was published uh, in English, <clears throat> in Spanish, but, you know, it still circulated a bit in Brazil. And, you know, you, you have sort of one half who says, how can you blame anybody but Bolsonaro for the situation we're in? You are, uh, you know, fighting, it. you're against the cause of getting this guy out of power. And the other side saying, you know, this is just sort of a, a left-wing scholar who's, who's trying to denigrate the president. So very few people who are sort of holding the ground in the center, willing to say, yeah, you know, there's potentially a couple of sides to this uh, problem we're facing right now. And I think it's very much uh, symbolized by the current debate in Brazil, um, which I think is not very useful, is whether uh, Bolsonaro is committing genocide by not protecting, by purposefully uh, uh, making vaccination efforts difficult by purposefully re uh, uh, recommending that his followers do not use masks, do not accept uh, social distancing measures. You know, so anybody who studies that term will know it's not really the appropriate term here, but it's exactly what Bolsonaro loves. It's uh, half of the population saying he's uh, guilty of genocide and the other half saying he's the savior. Uh, uh, and in this kind of scenario, you do not have a purpose, a meaningful discussion about good public policies. We don't have discussions about how to how, how best to tackle, um, or, or very limited discussions about how to best tackle the uh, the pandemic. And in in a way, uh, you know, my family, for example, is an example. We've had people who have very got very sick with COVID, and others who don't really believe that the pandemic is real, uh, which of course is something we've seen in other countries uh, as well. Now, uh, as Tom has said, this has regional consequences, and I think this is a problem across Latin America. When 
uh, there were crises in Bolivia, Ecuador, and Chile ahead of the uh, pandemic, right-wing uh, governments were saying, you know, these must be Cuban and, uh, and Venezuelan infiltrators who are causing trouble in Chile. Uh, whereas when uh, there was unrest in Bolivia, the left-wing government said, you know, this is a CIA uh, finance plot, thus making making it even more difficult for the countries in question to overcome their own polarization. So right now, the regional debate is so polarized that the region is making it more difficult for countries to find together. Now, it's very easy. How did Brazil get there? It's very easy to say, you know, this is Bolsonaro. He's very polarizing. He's the one to blame. But I think what's really important to point out is that you don't elect, no country in the world elects somebody like Bolsonaro who says, I'm against democracy. I'm very, uh, you know, I've, I, I, my, my idol is a torturer during the military dictatorship. Uh, you know, we must uh, imprison uh, Supreme Court justices and uh, hundreds of opposition figures unless the system is severely broken. And our system has been severely broken since 2013, when just like in Chile in 2019, the country suddenly was shaking by large scale protests, even though from an elite perspective, things were going really well. I remember I was in Japan at the time when the protests emerged because we were talking about, you know, strengthening Brazil-Japan relations. And, you know, Brazil was up and coming. Everybody was, was certain that, you know, the country would become a key player in global affairs. And we were blindsided because there was a degree of dissatisfaction brewing that a lot of people hadn't paid attention to. And even though the government was re-elected, the Workers' Party government was re-elected in 2014, the elections became so acrimonious that by the time the second mandate of Dilma Rousseff began, there was no longer a viable constructive discussion taking place between the government and the opposition. And when she was impeached, the opposition came basically to power, which is kind of unusual, her uh, her vice president turned against her and brought people from the center right into government and things didn't improve meaningfully which was the perfect situation for people to look at the situation and say everybody's corrupt the entire system is part is is is, is governing for themselves there's not a single politician who is doing his job right we need somebody who's from the outside and which was the perfect uh, context for uh, an, an outsider, which paradoxically wasn't an outsider at all, had been in Congress for two decades, for, for almost three decades, to sort of emerge and say, I'm anti-workers party and I'm anti-establishment. I'm anti-everything and I'm in favor of whatever you want to believe in, uh, which it, and what that is, is becoming apparent right now. Uh, so I think that I'd like to think that the system was so broken that Bolsonaro is a symptom. And if he hadn't emerged, some other anti-system politicians, I think, uh, a politician could have easily emerged um, and taken his place. So it's not, I mean, it's of course, he is partly to blame and it's, it's morally indefensible the way he's managing the pandemic, which is basically a denialist strategy. Uh, but, and this is my third point, he is very effective at it because people have um, I no longer look at the two sides uh, in a sort of uh, in a way of who's doing who's promoting better public policies, but very much as something about identity, uh, you know, uh, and, and you see that uh, throughout uh, all age groups, you have now dating apps, where before you actually get to meet anyone, you have to say which side you're on of the political spectrum, right, because people are unwilling to engage in a meaningful dialogue because there's, there's no point in sort of reaching out to the other side. And I think that's, you know, that has uh, made it possible to eliminate a meaningful public debate, which is, which is ideal for a government which needs extreme polarization uh, in order to distract also from other um, important problems that the government is unable to address successfully. Oliver, you want to finish it soon? Yeah. Uh, so what's next now? The, the ideal way of overcoming this, of course, would be the formation of a broad democratic alliance to face uh, this authoritarian president. But what happened now is with the return 
of the Workers' Party, Lula gained his political rights uh, and, and is most likely uh, running for president. We will have a very, a very likely a runoff between Lula and Bolsonaro uh, next year uh, with significant risks also of a replay of what we've seen, the troublesome uh, transition in the United States in 2020. I would consider that to be a best case scenario. The big difference in Brazil is that the armed forces are much, much more politicized than is the case uh, in the United States. So quite turbulent days ahead with very little space for centrists uh, to emerge, to reduce uh, the polarization, which therefore must be managed rather than eliminated. Thank you. Thanks, Oliver. Ken, it looks like we might have lost Angelica. I suspect she's trying to reconnect, but we're ready for the discussion. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I noticed that as well, seeing if we can get connected to her again. Um, thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks, Angel and Angelica, who's not with us, but hope to be back. And, and Oliver, thank you very much. Uh, wonderful presentations. There's, so, <laughs> there's a lot to have a conversation about. Um, but what's interesting, uh, Oliver, is, is you seem to indicate that if it's Lula and Bolsonaro, that in fact, there's the center gets crowded out of the Brazilian elections. Is that sort of, is that, is that, oh, here's Angelica's back with us. Welcome Angelica, it's good to see you. Um, is it, is, are you saying that for, you know, in going to the, to the, to the title of this, this session today, is that a good thing for, for trying to ameliorate or moving beyond the vis of politics if in fact it came to a Lula and Bolsonaro contest? Or does that exacerbate uh, the divisions that you talked about? Well, I think it, it does uh, deepen the divide. Um, and this is irrespective of what I think about whether he should have lost his political rights in the first place. Right. But uh, I think we're at a stage where by the time, and this I consider this to be the most likely scenario, and the runoff between the two, uh, both sides will consider the victory of the other as the equivalent of the end of the republic. Uh, and, you know, with very, very, I mean, in a fairly small uh, part of the electorate, uh, undecided, um, and I think an interest on both sides, both on the Workers' Party and Bolsonaro, to keep it that way, because both have no interest in the emergence of a centrist, uh, you know, a centrist candidate. Uh, so there's a weird situation in which Bolsonaro says, you know, if, which Lula is the only, is the ideal candidate for Bolsonaro to face and vice versa. So unfortunately, I think that this scenario makes it very, very difficult for centrists uh, to, to emerge because if you, you know, it's almost impossible to be, to have equidistance between the two. And as soon as you move slightly closer to the one side, all the others will accuse you of treason for being, you know, too close to one of those candidates on right and left. Yeah, I mean, because it's interesting. That's thank you, uh, but uh, bringing on Helica, that that's not dissimilar dynamic to Colombia, and certainly with view towards the election coming up next year, right? There are many, particularly in the government, um, in this government, and 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 the parties that back it, one principal party that want that extremism, right? And that's what that's they were dying for the last election to have their opposition in the second round beat someone like Petro, who was considered to be way too far left in Colombia to, uh, to ever win a, a national election. Now maybe B Mayor of Bogota as he had one in the past and maybe seats in Congress or the Senate. Um, is, that, is that a fear that you have? Because there is, there is one narrative in Colombia that this is exactly what the government has been wanting to have happen. The, you know, there's still the, the murder of, of social leaders with impunity, withdrawing just a couple of days ago from the Inter-American Court of Justice on the, on the, on the famous case of, of Bedoya, um, uh, the handling by the fiscal of the charges against ex-president Uribe. I mean, there's, there's a number of issues, which are the labeling of the children as, as armed combats by the current finance minister, which is a throwback to exactly what the Peace Commission was supposed to be addressing and will be addressing. Is, um, or do you have this fear that we're setting ourselves up in Colombia again for another rerun of two extremes? Or do you feel that this divisiveness, there's a real chance this time that this divisiveness can be bridged by a center candidate? 
what I see is that at least in comparison with the past presidential elections, uh, there is a growing group of people and also a, a growing portion of the Colombian electorate uh, that expresses some fatigue with these extremes, uh, which doesn't mean that they will not be funneled in, in for, for the effect of gaining electorally. I mean, it, if, if you look at networks and if you look at the discourse, you will see uh, people clearly wanting to underscore how extreme someone is and how much he needs or he or she needs to be feared. Um, but if you also look at uh, events such as the one that I described earlier, and if you look at the ground that the political center has in fact gained, even in electoral settings, you can also see the argument for the other side, which is, you know, yeah, we will fight for the microphones, but we will, but, 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 but in a way, we are also seeing something that has characterized Colombian politics for decades, which is that when the going gets tough, the elites will sort of try to figure out a way towards each other and will try to avoid the kind of costs that extreme polarization can represent. And this is something that, of course, uh, made the National Front possible several dec decades ago, which helped the country overcome the violence with a, with a, with a, with a capital B, uh, which also excluded from democratic politics new options and in a way created new sources uh, of grievances. But that, that is something that has been, has, been, has been used to describe Colombian politics uh, uh, in addition to what you just described. So I think I think we see both things. We see people benefiting from the extreme, uh, from the extremism and from and from and from pointing out how different they are, but then also sort of the the the, the less voice, the late the, the less the, the less the the, the so-called uh, silent politics is going on, which is where elites try to sort of brush things, brush problems under the rug and try to collaborate and cooperate. Uh, in the pursuit of larger national uh, issues. Whether that will continue and will continue to be successful, I, I, I can, of course, not know. But, but, but I would, I mean, if you ask me, would, would I bet on a centrist candidate uh, in this context? Yes, I would. I think there is electoral and public opinion room for someone of this, of this kind. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I've said for a long time, there is a much bigger center than everybody wants to acknowledge question is finding the proper vehicle for its expression is so to to to, to go back to that just and, and tom obviously I'd jump in anytime you want i would just all what what and, and, and Pelica was just describing as essentially and i don't want to hope i'm not mischaracterizing what you said on Haley, but part of this is just an exhaustion of by the you know this mass of people in the center however that wants to be defined exhaustion from the extremes um the, the people who, are rep who represent that extreme and just the ideas that are sort of emanating from those extremes. Um, it, it sounds like what you're saying in Brazil, um, that fatigue hasn't set in yet or may That's never right. set in, may set in because there are so many political parties and different stripes and so many other political games that go on that maybe there is not a proper expression for it or, or what's your thought about that? Well, I think that, yes, fatigue hasn't set in. And I think fatigue is sort of the ideal moment to overcome the worst elements of polarization because, of course, people are upset. And, you know, Brazil is a very young democracy. I mean, uh, you know, it, 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 anybody uh, over 40 uh, has still very you know, memories of, of, of dictatorship and, or, or, you know, pre-democratic Age. And I think there's a lot of uh, disappointment with, uh, you know, the experiment of, of the new republic. Uh, uh, and, and that, I think, can lead to, to sort of the outrage that, that you know, we want to uh, engage more in, 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 in polarization to, to seek to, you know, eliminate the other side in a way, because polarization is sort of a, a dual emergence also of uh, of two strands of thinking that do not fully see the others as, as legitimate. Uh, but then there's also, you know, the desire for um, rational public policy. And it's interesting that uh, in the midst of this ultra-polarized uh, national 
uh, situation, we've had uh, fairly normal uh, municipal elections. Uh, and, you know, the debate between the candidates for the mayorship of, of, of Rio and Sao Paulo, they were, you know, pretty normal um, because people seem to care more about sort of when it's about who's the mayor, they want, you know, the public transport to be fixed. And it's not really about communism or, you know, or neoliberalism. They just want, you know, government to do its job in a way. And I think that this will hopefully be how it ends, that also on a national level, and perhaps the pandemic can even accelerate this process where people realize, um, I don't care where the vaccine comes from. I want the government, I, I don't want a government who says, be careful the communist vaccine, you can't use the imperialist vaccine. No, it's, we want the vaccine, right? Uh, and, and I think that uh, this may be coming at some stage. Uh, it's not that clear yet, uh, but the, perhaps now this worst new chapter that we're going through uh, of the pandemic in Brazil could lead us to a situation where people grow tired and want sort of centrist policies that serve the population, irrespective of whether they're being implemented by a left-wing or right-wing politician. You see, Ken, I mean, the pattern of, in many countries that have had a very polarizing context, when centrism begins to make itself felt in the psychology of people, the polarizing leader actually needs to amp up the polarization. They become almost desperate to maintain it. Look at Erdogan in Turkey, for example. The conspiratorial theories that he engages in have become more and more outlandish because he needs to feed them. Orban in Hungary, Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, used to rail about the immigrants. You know, there are no immigrants in Hungary. So what is it now? It must be LGBTQ. It must be the European Union. You keep looking for the next enemy because you, you're like a shark that doesn't float naturally. You have to keep attacking. You have to keep swimming. You have to keep flapping those angry, angry fins because a polarizing leader doesn't float naturally. They have to be on the attack all the time. And so you see them amping up. Duterte in the Philippines, the same Modi in India, these people, they just keep amping up the attacks, choosing new targets. And that's the really dangerous dynamic uh, that, that occurs in these contexts. And, you know, that's why, you know, when Trump went into this mode in the 2020 electoral campaign, you know, Biden it was unusual that we had a centrist alternative, I mean, left of center, but centrist in many instincts, who was just steadfast in not being drawn into that fight. He just wouldn't respond to those during the campaign. Um, it just wouldn't rise to the occasion. And that was the best possible strategy in that case. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I just, yeah, there's, <laughs> Just a footnote to that and to my previous comments in, in, in Colombia, for example, and, and Angelica uh, could comment on this, is some of the biggest attacks on the center left, let's say, um, progressive left are coming from the extreme left, right? Which is, which, which is, right? <laughs> which is not, I mean, not a, a dynamic unknown, el, uh, uh, you know, elsewhere in the world. Um, if, if I might change the, I don't see any questions now, if I may change the subject a bit, um, and I think it's applicable to both countries specifically that we're talking about. And I know in the report, there was some conversation from uh, the section on Chile about uh, involvement of, of, of foreigners to help break certain log jams. And, but Oliver, you, I know you mentioned it specifically about the ability or, or the hope um, or the suggestion that outside actors could help steer Brazil away from its the, the current worst authoritarian impulses or, or something to that agree, to de degree. And I guess the question is, and I mean, I, the same kind of thing could be asked of Colombia, you know, steering it away from certain practices, however we might want to define those. But I guess the question is, in this day and age, how effective is that? Is it counterproductive? You know, and, and in the past, we would always say, okay, well, what can the U.S. do, right? And so there's that additional layer, what can any outside actor do if it wants to be so inclined? Um, and is it effective? Well, I think that above all, the domestic actors need to take the lead, of course. Uh, there is no way for the international community to fix the domestic challenges that have led to extreme and destructive polarization. Uh, in countries like Brazil, I, I don't, I cannot say about other countries, but in Brazil, uh, I think 
it, it needs to be above all solved by domestic actors, but I think international actors can play a helpful role. Uh, I think international institutions, even though they're being demonized by the current president as you know, globalist outfits that seek to intervene, et cetera, uh, involving Brazil in a normative framework does make a difference. Uh, first of all, once somebody else is in power, they can immediately refer to these uh, norm, uh, rules and norms. But even Bolsonaro, who demonizes globalism, etc., is desperate to join the OECD, for example, and is very is very sensitive to suggestions uh, that he may not be able to uh, uh, be part of the OECD, for example. I think that even though uh, you know when countries are denounced in international fora, they could be used to rally around the flag. It does uh, make a difference, and uh, the isolation that Brazil is experiencing right now is, of course, a point of concern for part of uh, Bolsonaro's uh, coalition, which are, you know, uh, business leaders. Uh, you know, the financial markets are very concerned that the Biden administration could, uh, if not sanctions, but pressure Brazil to do more against environmental destruction, human rights abuse, etc. So these things are extremely important to not sort of say, okay, let's forget about Brazil. It's not a, uh, it's not a constructive member of the global discussion at this stage, but to actually keep engaging the country and to continue to apply the rules and norms that are being discussed on an international level to Brazil, um, because as is the case here, uh, they uh, may lead the president to tone down his rhetoric uh, in some occasions uh, for example, initially in during the campaign, Bolsonaro promised his voters to leave the Paris Accords. The Europeans then got together once he was elected and said, if Brazil leaves the Paris Accords, then there's a strong likelihood of, uh, of boycotts against Brazilian products in Europe. And, as a, and then two days later, the president announced that Brazil would not leave the Paris Accords. So these things actually kind of, uh, I think, could stabilize domestic politics to some extent. Thanks, Oliver. And Hevika, let, let's let's play it out in in Colombia a little bit. Although I, I don't think that was something specifically that was talked about in your report. Different dynamic. But let let's say, for example, the Biden administration, and certainly there are people in the Biden administration um, who think the quote war on drugs is 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 ludicrous, and it's been uh, costly in too many ways, and in fact wants to do a complete reverse. And say, you know what? Forget Colombia. You know, we're not going to give you the, the all the um, the armaments and the, and and whatever you want to fight the drug war. We don't want you using uh, glyphosate, glyphosato, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how would that reverberate in in Colombia if something like that were to happen? So, so this is interesting because on the one hand, there have been hopes placed on. Uh, the new Biden government in terms of uh, strong, a very strong stance in favor of implementation of the peace agreement. So many people are hopeful that the U.S. will, in a way, at, at, least, at least from a public discourse point of view, uh, renew support of the agreement that was reached. But in terms of actual resources and in terms of its role in the in, in, in overcoming the drug trade, I, I agree with what you say. I think I think it is not clear at all whether there's going to be sufficient support for uh, doing both the the interdiction part in terms of you know this, this interfering with with the drug routes and and combating inter, uh, the criminal organizations, but also with the part that has to do with promoting uh, uh, crop substitution in Colombia, which is something that has been historically advocated, but is still very far from reaching the goals uh, that we aspire it to achieve, which is basically for peasants to find it more attractive to produce illicit goods instead of uh, illicit cocaine crops. Um, so I don't, I honestly don't see, and, and, and of course the pandemic plays a role in that too, I don't see that the U.S. will uh, assume either the political or the economic, neither the political nor the economic costs involved in fundamentally changing its presence regarding the illicit crops and the drug trade in Colombia. It might do so again, as, as I said, from a from a political from a from a from a from a, from a um, political statement point of view. But I don't think they will actually try to 
fundamentally modify uh, their current policies in that regard. Add to that the, the relationship with Venezuela. I think that is something that should also be mentioned in a way. Colombia is a key partner for the U.S. in dealing with the Venezuelan situation. There have been different efforts uh, on behalf of the Duque government to, in a way, support a solution or just find a way out in terms of, you know, supporting Guaido and supporting uh, the Lima Group and other uh, initiatives to uh, uh, find, uh, yeah, to, just to remove Maduro from, from power. And the U.S. has uh, tried to support those efforts on behalf of Colombian authorities, or they have been developed with the U.S. authorities. Um, and I think that would be an argument for the U.S. to also help Colombia with some of its internal and domestic issues in regards to the drug trade, sort of a sort of a sort of a trade-off or so, sort of a combination of efforts to deal both with the drug, the drug trade and the Venezuela problem, which is a drug trade problem too now uh, at the same time. Thank you, Angelica. We have some really great questions that I want to get to, but Tom, maybe if I could call on you to give some perspective about the the uh, what would appear to be a little bit more delicate. Uh, balancing act that strong foreign powers, let's say the United States, for example, the role that they can play in trying to move countries to be more democratic. Is you have some thoughts about that? Well, it's, yeah, it is. A, it's really delicate. I mean, the U.S. is really struggling to re-engage on democracy and human rights support, given the travesty of the policies of the recent administration, but it's trying to do so in a way that first, you know, it's crucial that the U.S. approach this in a much more of a partnership way. So it's not the U.S. and Bolsonaro, it's the European Union, the OECD, the Lima Group, well, that's what, but not Venezuela, but whoever it happens to be who's concerned. So they have to do that. Second, they have to stand up for principles, not for people, and say, you know, our principle here is dialogue, our principle is sticking to the norms and the constitution, you know, in obeying this and what we stand for is, you know, our legal norms, both domestic and international, we're not trying to weigh in on the election and so forth. Doing so not just thirdly, not just around elections, but, you know, throughout the whole process and say we're not weighing in on an election, we're standing up for these principles throughout and so forth. So, you know, a lot of sensitivity needs to be done because these leaders will make the most they can out of any sort of what looks like foreign interference. And so it has to be done, you know, in, in, in these kinds of thoughtful ways, but it is possible. We do need to engage, but the democracy community doesn't really have a polarizing handbook because it hasn't really faced this question. It has in civil war contexts, but not in places like Brazil, which is not a civil war context, the degradation of democracy context. So policymakers need to refine their approaches on this because they're really just starting, same with India, same with Turkey, same with Brazil, et cetera. Thank you, Tom. Um, I know we've gone over the hour by if, by a minute. Um, if folks uh, will indulge us, uh, Tom and Angelica, Oliver, maybe for a few more minutes, I'd like to see if we can get to a couple of these questions. Um, uh, one, by the way, Abe, Abe Lowenthal, thanks for listening. Abe, you ha oh, you, you, you came back with your question. Okay. Um, let's, let, let's start with uh, a question from, from Jessica Corredor Villamil. What about civil society? How to counter this increasing global polarization in a collective way? And could you please address the role of social media? And <laughs> whoever wants to start with that. Civil society, the role of, how can civil society get engaged meaningful, meaningfully? And, you know, and uh, to move things along and in, in, in the face of um, counter democratic, uh, messages that come across social media. Kilika, go ahead. Yeah, I can take that. Um, I, I'm starting I, I with have... the easy questions first, on here, because <laughs> yeah, so go ahead. exactly, why not? Social media and civil society. <laughs> um, so, so, so I have not studied this, I should, I should, I should, I should warn. Uh, but what I see is that, in fact, there's a, there's, there's different takes on this question. Because in a way, social media is civil society, of course. I mean, it's an expression of some of some some important sectors within society. At the same time, this of course is not representative 
of the whole of what we could call public opinion or civil society overall. Very few people have access or even interest in participating in these ongoing discussions. Uh, and we also know that, uh, uh, that the, it, certainly, it certainly overshadows other sorts of debates or consensus that may be occurring within society. Specifically in relation to my earlier points, I would like just to say that if you only look at the social media, you will say, you know, this is a deeply divided country where there's no room for any sort of uh, 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 in, in encounters or, or, or consensus among different groups. And, and however, what I observe from, from who's attending, who's meeting, who's speaking on what matters, who, who's, who's attending conferences, writing letters, taking part in, in all sorts of uh, public events even, uh, I, I do see what I said earlier, which is there is room for people expressing a need for finding a common ground and perhaps a political center. So, so there's that distinction. In addition, in addition to that, civil society, of course, is also measured by public opinion surveys. Um, and there we see, for instance, that there has been a historic preference for uh, negotiated outcomes in Colombia. So this contrasts with what we would see on social media, which is this idea that the negotiation was a complete failure and the country was basically sold out to, 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 the, to the communists. Uh, uh, and there you and then you have this, again, this, this, this much more, what we call in Colombia, TVO, which is sort of a lukewarm attitude towards negotiations saying, you know, yeah, you, you, you don't like them, but you need them because you don't have the state capacity to actually be victorious in, 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 in conflict. And I think that sort of pragmatic understanding looms quite large over Colombians overall. Uh, so that there's that too. And then, and then thirdly, I would also like to perhaps mention um, civil society organizations. And this is interesting because in contrast to many other uh, uh, countries that have been hard hit by war, uh, Colombia has also been a very fertile ground for civil society peace initiatives. So here, instead of, you know, it, I mean, conflict intensity heights or, or, or spikes in conflict intensity actually coincide with an increase in civil society peace initiatives, which have also been somewhat uh, stimulated from above by means of, you know, legislation saying in order to discuss this public policy on victims reparations, we need to have victims organization present. Uh, and therefore, there's been a growth in victims organizations, and this has happened for us for several topics overall. Um, so, so there has been that, but overall, the, the, the point that I need to make here is to show how there has been growing and very impressive activism on behalf of civil society organizations amidst war, and all of them coincide uh, uh, on one issue, which is to find this common ground. These are organizations that are um, most of the time against extremisms, they are most of the time in favor of promoting encounters between the extremes. And I think that needs to be acknowledged as well as one of the, I, I would say, one of the assets that Colombia has in light of its future challenges. So, so from all these different opinions, I think, uh, from all these different perspectives, I would say, uh, we, we, we have different takes on what civil society means and how we can put in context what social media shows us. Excellent, thank you. Oliver, is there anything, uh, there should be enough material there for you to work with in, in how it might apply to Brazil, no? Yo, know, absolutely, absolutely hmm. uh, Ken. I, um, uh, I'd like to add to what Angelica said, is that, um, you know, civil society and supporting civil society uh, remains one of the best ways to um, reduce the probabilities of a breakdown of democracy uh, in Brazil. Uh, and, you know, uh, the decision by the Brazilian government to suspend, for example, the payments made multi-million dollar, uh, billion dollar payments, actually, by Norway and Germany for the uh, Amazon fund, uh, uh, you know, is a sign that uh, uh, the government is willing to forego tremendous financial support in the battle against deforestation in order to weaken civil society because part of the deal negotiated with Oslo in Berlin at the time was that a significant amount of this money would go to civil society and civil society sit on the board when decision make, decisions were made as to how to spend this money. And as the United States now through uh, uh, John Kerry is negotiating uh, the amounts of money 
the, the exact amount of money that the United States is willing to pay Brazil to help it protect the Amazon, it will be absolutely crucial uh, to stand firm and not accept the Brazilian government's proposal to, uh, that this money is going straight to the government uh, without engaging civil society. And I think this is something we see with authoritarian minded governments all over the world uh, which are very critical of universities um, and uh, NGOs because they cannot fully control them. Uh, of course, civil society is not immune to polarization uh, and it's no guarantee to avoid uh, the breakdown of democracy, uh, but it's absolutely crucial through investigative mechanisms, uh, strong newspapers, uh, engaging, you know, organizing, promoting debates and also being able to provide goods, public goods, where government cannot, uh, I think is one of the most important activities uh, in, in, the, in the defense of democracy. And vis-a-vis -vis social media, I think that uh, just like in Europe and the United States, rather than having sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, mom in short moments where sort of, uh, you know, Twitter bans one person or another, I think what's needed in Brazil is a, is a clearer framework of what can be said, what can be shared, and what cannot. Uh, because as in the United States, I think social media has contributed to uh, the polarization that we're seeing right now. Uh, and I think it's through legislation rather than uh, eliminating the profile of one or another politician that we're capable of maintaining that debate that social media promotes, but in a less polarized fashion. Thanks, Oliver. Tom, did you want to weigh in on this? No. no. Okay, let me just take, if, indulge one last question, just quick answers, because uh, I really don't want to hold people longer. And it's from uh, Abe Lowenthal. Thanks for uh, resubmitting, Abe. Um, and the question is, what role do you expect major leaders of business community in the formation of a consensus around an alternative to Bolsonaro? Um, and that obviously is directed at Oliver, but I don't want to leave Angelica out of this because we love to hear her opinion as well, is what role she thinks the, the business leaders in Colombia might make in, for example, helping to find a consensus in the center uh, in the lead up to the next election. So Oliver, do you want to start us off and I, and I will give uh, Angelica the last word on that. Sure. So Bolsonaro was elected in 2018 because he was able to put together a fairly unique uh, a voter coalition made up of, uh, uh, military, of the military for people concerned about public security, uh, of, uh, radic of, of uh, very, very uh, uh, conservative, uh, social conservatives, uh, uh, radical ones concerned about you know, social mores, etc., to mobilize the religious population but also a neoliberal uh, minister of the economy, the Chicago boy, uh, in order to bring the uh, business community on board. And I think that was sort of the, I think one of the perhaps one of the, the, the greatest problems of, 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 of uh, you know, Latin America's economic neoliberals is that historically uh, they have uh, sought to work with uh, illiberals uh, who uh, sought to promote economic liberalism uh, paired with a social illiberalism. And Bolsonaro promoted that very model in 2018. And I think a lot of uh, people in the business community uh, were you know, happy enough that there would be a neoliberal, uh, and, and, I, and I don't use this as a pejorative term, but a, a reformist of, uh, minister of the economy, uh, no matter what the rest of, of the, the, the president's proposals involve. And I think uh, that is now uh, turning out to be a problem because it's very difficult to be an economic liberal while being a social, socially very illiberal and authoritarian president. Uh, so th these are groups now that are a bit orphaned because a lot of them are concerned about the, uh, the return of the Workers' Party. Um, but again, I cannot see these groups to side with either of the two uh, polls, but also too weak in order to promote their own candidate so I, I don't expect them to have a decisive a role in the uh, 2022 election. Thank you, Oliver. Angelica, I'm pleased to give you the last word. The business Thank community you. and helping to perhaps form some sort of consensus in the middle. So, so two takes on this. First of all, um, one uh, now deceased 
business leader once said to me, you know, no one in their right mind would oppose the government. And I think this is very illustrative of what uh, Colombian business has done historically, which is uh, develop very strong, very close collaboration, which has been considered, of course, virtuous by some. If you look at, at the strategy that has helped coffee forward, you will see that that has rested on very close collaborative networks between the state and the private sector. But on the other hand, this, of course, can also always be a source of uh, corruption, just say, just say very briefly. However, uh, the, the, the Colombian tradition is to is for the private sector to be very close to government. And this explains on the one hand why, for instance, after having been open supporters of the peace process and the peace building initiatives uh, before Duque, during Santos, when they even were part of the negotiation group, when they supported uh, local and regional conferences, when they supported programs to advance the interests of victims and train demobilized combatants, they now turn to a much more low profile um, attitude faced with the peace process. This is not this is not a reflection of the fact that they might not no longer want negotiations, but this I guess has more to do with they don't want to openly oppose uh, uh, the government and the state, which they very much rely on for contracts, for access to resources, etc. Uh, so, so that I think is important. At the same time, what I have seen is that, in addition to that sort of going, going, going on on low on 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 the lower part of the radar, uh, there are um, uh, groups, sectors uh, among the, the the larger companies. Uh, that rule the Colombian domestic economy, which have expressed concern about extreme polarization, that have invited candidates, for instance, to sort of be accountable for what they publicly say to test how um, complicated their electoral victories might be for business interests. And they have also supported some of these um, efforts to construct historic or, or, or construct common ground pacts. They are very much part of that conversation uh, because, I mean, as I said, they, I think, fear uh, the costs of extremism, both on the right and on the left for uh, health of their business interests. So, so I would see them overall to be supportive of such an option in Colombia. Thank you, Angelica. Um, we've gone 75 minutes. Um, Tom, unless you have any final words that you would like, no, okay. Let me thank you again, Tom, Angelica, Oliver. Thank you for the report. For those who listened, who haven't listened to the, uh, haven't read the report, I invite you to go to the website for the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and read it there. Um, it, the different reports from the there are other countries as well are discussed that we haven't discussed today. There are conclusions that are very, very succinct and I think very useful for those who don't even want to read through the full reports. Thank you for your time, um, all of you again. Thank you for all our listeners. As I mentioned at the outset, this uh, video will be available on our website by tomorrow at the latest at ccacanada.com. Thank you. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Have a great bye. afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.